I didn't expect to sing. I knew I loved music, but I don't come from a family where everyone is a musician or this person is a musician, no. She's a sexy goddess of soul. I'm in danger, danger, danger. Who took on the role as the lead singer of the all girls group, Blue Three, that made Ugandans proud. For some reason, when Blue Three was starting out, Lillian was more at the front. What about the dreams? What about the fairy tales? Is there anything left to say now? I think that if Blue Three had stayed till today, because when we broke up, I didn't really see it as a breakup. From picture now, but I won't let them get me down. Her unique voice has got many thinking. If indeed she could be Uganda's own Erica Badu. Lillian was always the strong voice. <laughs> This daughter of the soil is a single mother who has had to battle her way through a rock and a hard place to reach the success that only the strong-hearted persons can achieve. <laughs> People really got to know about Moses was because I got pregnant. Being in the industry that we're in, people want to see you pregnant. With her band, the Sundowners, that's a different brand altogether. Lillian has found solace, a move that she believes has got her through the high tides of the never-ending battles within the music industry. This is Lillian Babazi, the story behind the Billboard star. For her vocal abilities, this ever-growing strong woman and her band, the Sundowners, have seen it all, both in her private and public platforms. The band, for me, is my way of, you know, just relaxing and enjoying music because I don't like to do playback singing anymore. If we are looking at these times, the relevance of live bands is just growing, so it is a very strategic move that she has taken. Uh -huh. The Good Life team has remarkably propelled her to a comfortable spot on the charts with hits that have become anthems within the local audiences. 80% of my Luganda songs have been written by Moses. Most of her hits, he has written them and, and think they work well together. <laughs> Today, as she settles down to look after her children, Lillian is working hard behind the scenes to nurture her children and rebuild a career she fought so hard to build. Those blessings that came with my children have brought me this far and made me the woman that I am right now. She's a good mother, a happy one at that, and her children love her. Lillian Babazi was born on the 28th of October, 1984, in Zambia Hospital. A family of five children, born to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Kahirwe. I'm a middle child. Uh, my sisters are older than me and my brothers are younger than me. Lillian's mother worked as a midwife in Kigo prison, while her father served in the Rwandan military. He was among the people who were, you know, in the bush. Whenever he had a moment, Lillian's father would be drawn into music and acting, and perhaps the only explanation as to why she was attracted to the industry as well. Maybe I got a little bit of the musical thing from him because he, he enjoyed the whole drama and, and acting and stuff. Lillian was raised in the suburbs of Kampala, in a town called Wandegea, and attended Buganda Road Primary School, which was a stone throw away from home. What I remember is I didn't study P1. Um, first of all, P1 was full, so they just put me in P2. I, don't, I didn't study P1. At school, Lillian was a very reserved young lady. She never participated in any traditional dance or school drama activities. I was very shy. It's hard to believe, but I was very shy and I was very... I kept to myself a lot. 
when I was in primary because I was not yet used to, you know, being around people when I started school. Despite her reserved nature at school, Lillian was quick to engage her fellow students by helping out in their mathematics homework for a little bit of money. This eventually got her into trouble. I used to help kids to do their homework and then I don't do my homework and they send me. <laughs> I remember I was sent for my mom, like, bring your parents to school and I kept dodging, like, I would stay home and tell my mom, oh, my back is hurting, oh, my head, like, I'd make excuses to prolong her coming to school until they called my sister. Now, my sister was in a class ahead of me and she was in P5 and they tell her, please call your mom. Why? Why do you have to do this? Like, can't you just tell them she's not around? <laughs> so when they told my mom, my mom was tough. I was so scared of this woman. I thought she was going to murder me. <laughs> so she came speaking Kinyarwanda, you know. And once the parent switches to the local dialect, you know you are finished. You're gone. Lillian's father continued to work in Rwanda, while her mother stayed behind in Kampala to look after the children. Times got hard and the cracks started to show in the family's finances. You were always the kids they chased away for school fees at school. <laughs> it was that kind of life because uh, my dad was, was, first of all, rarely there because he was, you know, fighting to liberate the people of Rwanda. It was so difficult. But my mom, she's my inspiration. She's a very hardworking woman, very strong woman. She made sure that, you know, at least we had something to eat and something to you know, we had something like clothes to wear and shoes. You'd wear your one pair of shoes the whole time and you're okay with it. Because you know what? This is who we are. This is the life we, are, we, are, we, we know. We didn't know anything different. Of course, you go to school, you meet other kids who have this and that. But she instilled this thing in us that be grateful for the little that you have. With every day that went by, the financial crisis hit the ceiling and it became impossible to survive. Prompting Lillian's mother to take her children to a Christian-based organization in Tinder called Compassion. It was here that they would get foreign sponsors to provide them with all their needs. And that organization is actually helped me go through most of my primary school. Like I didn't, I didn't pay for my school fees in that way. I was, I always got a sponsor to, you know, help me get my education. Otherwise, I would have been one of those illiterate children. <laughs> During the Rwandan war that saw many Rwandans lose their lives, Lillian and her family stood together in prayer as family members were dead worried as to what could happen to all the family members who were one way or another involved in the war. I remember my uncle was hurt in the, in the, in the war and they had to like amputate his leg and stuff. He's the one who actually made me realize that something serious was going on. And my dad, we were always worried. Are we going to see him again? Is he going to come back home? It was a very confusing time for me. I, I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew there was something bad that was going on. After the 1994 Rwanda genocide, Lillian and her family returned to Chigali. My dad was like, it's time to come back home. We've won the war. It's time to move back. <laughs> We had to go and, you know, do some barrier arrangements for some family members that had passed on and also settle back home. But Lillian would quickly be returned to Kampala to finish her primary education in 1995. I came back to finish my primary, which I finished in 95. So in 96, I went to Kigali, I went back to Kigali, I studied my S1 from there and I made so many friends and there was like a Rwanda Liberation Day and stuff like that. And our family was at home, we were watching TV, following the celebrations. Then my cousins got a bright idea, there were, the celebrations were like maybe 10 minutes from our house, you could walk there as kids, you just walk in a group and you're fine. So we go through the back door and we decide to go down to the celebrations. Now when we're there, we just want to enjoy and see what's happening. There was a live band. To get to the band was not as difficult. And I remember one of my cousins, Izan, who went and talked to the band and said, hey, we have our sister here, can she sing a song? Blah, blah, blah. They're like, okay, you bring her. So my friends and my 
cousins are like, yeah, you go, you go and sing for us a song, go and sing for us a song. I remember this is my first live performance in front of anyone ever. <laughs> Whitney Houston for me was my ideal musician. I had all her music, I sang all her songs from the house. Like everybody in the house would always hear me and they would be like, keep quiet, why are you, why are you making noise for us? I remember I sang I Would Always Love You by Whitney Houston. That was a natural song for me because I always sang it at home and I admired her so much. What I didn't know was it was being broadcast live. So who's watching TV at home? My parents. And <laughs> they watched me on TV. They're like, mm, but this, mm, isn't this our child? Like, isn't she around the house or something? They called for me, they couldn't find me. And <laughs> next thing they know that my cousins are coming, they're tipping me some coins and what. <laughs> During her secondary education, Lillian's interest in her studies wasn't something she gave much thought about as much as she did with her music. I was not really, I was not caring about the, 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 the schoolwork. I was mostly concentrating on me being a musician, me being a singer, like that's what I decided. <laughs> This eventually sent her mother drawing up some measures to ensure that her daughter did what every other kid did to get good grades. And my mom could not handle it. She could not handle it. She thought, you know, you're not going to get spoiled when I'm looking at you. My aunt lives here in Uganda, my mom's sister, and she was like, please get her to school. Let's get her into boarding school immediately. Amongst the many things she drew up was having to enroll Lillian into a boarding school. This was the only possible way to get her to focus on her education. And when they brought me back, I went to St. Peter's in Zambia, but I think that was the first school they got. I stayed there for a term. I was like, Mom, please. So they moved me to St. Lawrence, where I finished my senior four. I studied the rest of my uh, high school from there. But I was very much involved in the music when it came to you know, those years of my life, because now I'm grown, I'm like 15 years old, I'm 16, I'm like, yes, music is what I love to do, this is what I want to do. In a series of events that saw the little unknown Jame at school go about her business, Lillian caught the eye of her headmaster, Mr. Muchibi Lawrence, who went on to ask her to perform at different campuses around the country. Mr. Muchibi would always call me to go to different campuses to perform. Uh, those things of miming other people's songs. <laughs> and I was very, very much involved in like, especially the, the music, dance and drama section where I do the traditional dances, the, the Western piece, all that. I was very, very active. This would only elevate her to a greater height. Boy, me love you, me not know why. When I see you, my heart's go. Lillian later joined Kaboja Secondary School and continued doing what she loved to do. There it was, uh, it was school, it was just entertainment, I would, I, would, I would involve myself in whatever entertainment was there at school. But only this time, it would be in the church. Every Sunday, I would wake up, I, was, I would have a song that I prepared for the church, and it was my main place of singing. Coming up... I went searching for a job. I told my mom, I'm going to search for a job. I'm not going to sit here during my vacation doing nothing. With her education on the side, Lillian returned to Chigali and with the help of a friend, she got a job to perform at the Mill Collins Hotel that lasted for more than a year. Some friend of mine told me, ah, oh, there's like a small club, they, they, they have a live band and they perform every Friday and Saturday and I can hook you up. So I went with my cousin and we, we talked to the owner of the place. I told them I'm a singer, I'm in my senior six vacation and I was wondering if you could, you know, allow me to come and sing with you guys from time to time. And then they auditioned me 
and the owner, Albert, he said, please come on Friday with your mom, because obviously I'm 18 now, but they needed my mom to still consent to, to me being there. So I'm like, mom, don't say anything. I'm in my vacation, I've finished school, so at least just allow me to do this while I'm in my vacation. So she came the first night and she was like, oh, okay. She knew the people who actually, who owned the place and they told her, we'll take care of her. So I was like, and I also had a gig at Milkolin. Milkolin is one of the biggest ho hotels in Kigali. So I would have a gig there as well over the weekends. So I would either perform at the small club or at Milkolin. It was always like back and forth. And that's how I loved the live experience like I, I became more of a live singer like I love to sing with bands with no more challenges to address in Chigali and the desire to go professional in her music Lillian returned to Kampala in the hope of finding answers of what she was looking for DV8 was her answer, as this had become the go-to place for every startup artist and big name in the industry today. Uh, my friend uh, Liz used to perform uh, at DV8, and I went there because they told me that's where you know every artist or every you know, musical shows happen there. Um, I remember going there and feeling a bit overwhelmed. It's my first time, remember, to to be out in you know, in a crowd like this. I'd never met guys who are, you know, wild and all sorts of things went down at DV8. It was like, <laughs> it was some sort of, uh, I don't know, it was like a hub of uh, musicians and DJs and stuff. So for me going there, it was more like, let me see what I'm getting myself into. And me being there, of course, as a young kid, you're, you're so excited, you're like, oh my God. Maybe one day I'm also going to be performing at DV8. That's how low your dreams are. So I remember going there and thinking, ah, I don't know. I don't know if this is the place that I want to sing from. I just remember hearing about Steve Jin. Steve Jin, Steve Jin, he's a producer, he's a singer, he's a, you know, he can help you, he can do this for you. And it was the late DJ Momo who actually introduced me to Steve Jin because Momo, I used to find Momo a lot at DV8 and stuff. So that's how I got the connection to Steve Jin. And I remember going there thinking, is he going to like the way I sing? Is he going to enjoy my singing? And he put me in a booth and told me, okay, just sing any song. That was it. And he was like, he didn't really know what to do for me at that time. I guess he would, he would have made a plan. In 2003, while at the university, she received a call from Dungeon Studio protege, Steve Jean, a renowned producer, who asked her to take part in the Coca-Cola pop star competitions. This came with tremendous opportunities, including the possibility of forming a music group. When pop stars came through, Steve Jean told me, Lillian, this is, this is it. This is what you're going for. Go and, go and audition and see what happens. I remember thinking, <sighs> Will I win? It looks so fancy on TV, yeah? You know how they, they make everything look so fancy on TV. I remember waking up very early in the morning and saying, I have to be among the first people to audition. I was actually the fourth person to audition that day. I was nervous. I was like, eh. you know, when you you have this little doubt, you don't believe in yourself that much. But I just said, you know what, I'm going to try my luck. So I got there. I see all these people who have won competitions, there was Cindy, there was Dorothy Bukira, you know, all these guys who had, you know, been in the real stars and hey, everyone saw them as celebs. But me, I was like, you know what, when my time comes, it will come. And I remember going through the competition and the judges were very impressed with my, with my singing. She had a beautiful, very strong voice. She would sing and the whole room would be infected by her sound. <laughs>
With a little bit of luck, Lillian made it through, but would come face to face with her biggest hurdle, and this time it would be her mother. The, the level that I was nervous about was the one where they were taking us to Mombasa now. They were taking 15 people from each country to go to Mombasa for one week, training, singing, and the winner eventually would emerge from that. Now I have to travel, so that's where the problem comes from. Remember, I've been doing this silently. I've not told my mom anything. Uh, so I get a bus to Kigali, and I've already prepped my sisters and brothers. I'm like, you guys have got to have my back, otherwise they won't allow me to go. So they tell her, ah, she's like, okay, but what about school? Like, ah, uh -uh, you get a dead year, then you come back, and then you resume school again. So I went, she agreed, that's how I went uh, to Mombasa, and it was my first time on a plane. <laughs> Going on that plane was my first time. Because obviously, to Kigali, you just bust it, you know? No one, no one, no one is going to pay for your flight. Um, so sitting on a plane for the first time, I was like, eh, this is interesting, nice. <laughs> I didn't know I'd, I'd be able to, you know, uh, sit on a plane this soon. So going to Mombasa and you're staying this fancy, this fancy, we stayed at White Sands. It was a really fancy hotel, and they took really good care of us. Um, I remember thinking that, yeah, this is the right decision I made. I was so nervous because there were different people from Kenya, from Tanzania, and everyone was in the room whenever anyone was competing. Like, whatever you're doing, any activity, everyone was around. So it doesn't matter, plus judges and coaches. But it was such a good experience for me that... I had to work even harder to make sure that I actually win. The skies above blue, my heart was wrapped up in clover. So they come to my friend's home because that's where I used to stay. And they tell me, oh, you're one of our winners. The whole house was upside down. We were dancing and what. But the thing is, I already knew that I'd won. That really briefed me. That told me, like, you know what? Just make sure you are very surprised. <laughs> well, don't tell the people at home, but just make sure. Because their reaction was the one which was, wow. They, they, they didn't expect it. So I kept quiet. I didn't mention to anyone. We moved to, went to South Africa without anyone knowing. Because we couldn't tell anyone that we had won until the show started airing on TV. So when we went to South Africa, that's when... They started airing the competition and everything. So guys in Uganda actually didn't know who had won. And I didn't know who else had won in the group. I didn't know it was Cindy or Jackie. I had no idea. Lillian was said to join the other two girls that included Jackie Chandiru and Cinderella Sanyu. We meet with the girls and everyone is excited. We're like, oh my God, we're going to, we've won a competition. Um, we're going to South Africa. It's the first time any of us is going there, you know. Uh, leave alone the fact that we were sitting on the plane now for like the third time because obviously the two and fro from Mombasa then now go to South Africa. We're seeing a huge country we have never seen before, like fancy cars, fancy this, fancy this. Uh, it was it was something else. I remember feeling like I'd won the lottery that day. I was like so happy. All my ladies in the house, let me see you burn. Make it burn, make it burn. And all my fellows in the house, let me see you burn it. Make it burn. We were told by uh, the company, uh, the Coca-Cola company, because Coca-Cola obviously was in charge, they told every every country to come up with a name for their group. We came up with so many ridiculous names, Axel, I don't know, Axis, I don't know, so many ridiculous names. At the end of the day, Steve said, we want to find out what is uh, it, what do you have in common, as all of you said, we're Ugandan, we're girls, you know, and we're black women. Black can be beautiful, can mean bootylicious, can mean anything. So we're like black ladies from Uganda. Blue, and then we're three. Blue three. Oh, one, two, three, and up. Blue 3 was the Ugandan all-girl band formed in April 2004 while in South Africa. 
The name was created to mean three beautiful ladies from Uganda. While in South Africa, the girls went on to produce their debut album, Hitaji. That was our very first album. Which spawned the hit singles, Hitaji, Frisky, and Tomalako. On returning home, Lillian's fears of whether they would be accepted as a girl group took the most part of our confidence. But with the guidance of Steve Jean, Lillian and her team were able to stride through a fire of storms the music industry had to offer. Uh, we were very nervous when we came back. We didn't know what people were going to think of us or our music. In the midst of everything that was going on, Lillian remained humble while at the university. I was doing social sciences, and so I tried to do both at the same time. I would go to school in the evenings, and then during the day, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working and stuff. I like the way you move, like the way you go, baby. I like the way you walk, like the way you talk to me. You're fly, you're the kind of man I want. I like your baggy jeans, like your Timberlands. I even like the way that you do your smile. We had come as a different thing, something different that, I don't know, Ugandans hadn't seen yet. It was very different from what was there at that time. We were seeing a lot of English and accents and all of this stuff that people didn't understand here. But we were very excited uh, when they, you know, they started liking our music and started warming up to us. With fans of Blue 3 making daily demands for the girls to make a concert, the girls launched Hitaji at the Lugogo Cricket Oval in December of the same year. This attracted thousands of fans. We had to have a concert. That's when we did our Hitaji concert. I like the way you move, like the way you go, baby. I like the way you walk, like the way you talk to me. You're fly, you're the kind of man I want. I like your baggage. But we're still confused, you know. We're still trying to find ourselves on the stage and still trying to, this one is trying to outshine the other. We don't know that it's a group. Everyone is trying to be seen, you know? Everyone is trying to be the star. The Hitaji video went on to win Video of the Year at the Pearl of Africa Music Awards. And we actually became one of the biggest selling girl groups in Uganda. We got nominated in the very first year for the, the Kora Awards by then. We started performing outside. We did a, a tour in the UK. We did a tour in, uh, we went to Nigeria and, and Ghana. We started doing awards all over the place. We went to South Africa to perform and having these audiences of just 5,000 to 10,000 people in just a span of two years. And just when everything seemed to be going fine, Blue 3 stumbled, causing Cinderella Sanyu to part ways with the group. <laughs> she told the world that we, we, we fired her or chased her, but till today I still can't believe she lied like that. They used to take annual holidays in, in Jan, Feb. So there was a bit of a, a gap. And um, pretty much in that gap was the time when Cindy decided that she wanted to do a solo career. and Her boyfriend then had decided to, you know, get her some producers out of Uganda. And I remember talking to her every single day and telling her, are you sure you want to leave the group? Are you sure? The way she did it, the way she handled her leaving, um, was not right. And considering, I mean, really, the way they had been formed, the way they came together, the, the way they'd gone through, you know, their musical journey. Because we have not even found a new member yet, because it doesn't make sense for us to find a new member. In the whole group, she's the one who had a relationship that was bent towards marriage more than anything, if my mind serves me right. And I think it got to a point where she had to decide, maybe, uh, between music and family. And choosing family meant moving away with a gentleman. And we, were, we had discussions, like before even like anyone knew about her leaving. We had so many discussions telling us, Cindy, blah, 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 please come back, please come back. And Jackie and I still like the group. We still like what we're doing, and we still like our endorsements with different companies. So all that we had to think about. Coming up. Getting Maya on was kind of a challenge. We knew her more as the dancer obsessions, then they tried to sing. She was not as good a vocalist as uh, Cindy.
with Lillian and Jackie's desire to keep the Blue 3 brand fully operational, they went on a search for a new member, and Edith Baganda, aka Maya, would be their much anticipated answer. Getting Maya on was kind of a challenge because she has come to two vocalists, yeah? And she's not really a vocalist. She's more of a performer, dancer, stroke dancer. We knew her more as the dancer obsessions, then they tried to sing, then, you know. But now I'm coming up to be in this duo of strong voices that have actually stood the stage internationally and all. I felt it was going to be a big challenge for her and huge shoes to fit in. She was just getting into the whole singing thing. She didn't have the experience. People talked about her singing. She was not as good a vocalist as... Uh, Cindy, of course, she wasn't, she isn't. But for us, we're like, you know, better somebody who looks good, can dance, and will sing, you know, will hold the group. And she'd actually, she could actually sing, you know, a little bit. For us, it was a decision to keep the brand alive. She did try her rounds and uh, I wasn't going to make it. And I told the manager at the time that, you know what, this girl is such a dancer, and you need to highlight on that, because she came out of combat dancers. I was like, you need to maybe just do some solo dance moves for her during their performances, so that she also shines. With the group now in place, Blue 3 embarked on heading to the studio to produce Be Free album. And it was during this time that Lillian conceived. That album, for me, I feel like was a, one of our best work as... as uh, as Blue 3 because me and Jackie basically put our hearts and souls into that last album that we did, Be Free, that was the name of the album. So after that, I, I conceived. I'm losing my mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sending you a love letter. And I hope you get this love letter. She welcomed her son, Asante, on the 12th of September, 2010. Called Asante because you know it was it means thank you and because it was also a difficult pregnancy and stuff like that so for me it was like thanking God like thank you for this this human being so every time I say Asante I'm like yeah thank you <laughs> after giving birth Lillian chose to concentrate on motherhood putting a brief hold on music it was the best decision I ever made in my life to have to have a child because changed my life in so many ways, gave me a different perspective on life and actually made me grow up in like a few days. <laughs> it does that to you. You grow up like immediately, like you, you, you stop thinking about you, now you're thinking about somebody else. Because I was into the party scene, I like to go out and like to, you know, I was always hungover. <laughs> but now with a baby, things changed. I was like, you know what, I'm going to concentrate first on motherhood. Let's say goodbye to Blue 3 for the meantime. <laughs> this would eventually disband the group that the public had fallen in love with. On Lillian's first hit single, Vitamin, was released, too many questions were making rounds without any answers. People speculated a lot of stuff about who the father of my child was. And for me, not coming out to clarify that is not because I didn't want to, because I don't owe anybody anything. Of course, public eye, guys hungry for the stories. I remember they said, oh, it's Weasels, <laughs> Weasels baby. Then again, they said, who? Oh, you know, they'll always have stories. It was soon revealed that the baby's father was none other than Moses Sechibogo, also known as Mose Radio of the Good Life Crew. So when finally it came out that uh, Moses was the father uh, of the baby, Everyone was shocked because they're two different people. You're like, how did they meet? Well, we actually met on campus. He used to sit behind me uh, in our psychology class. This is the night I don't want to wait. Oh, baby. Give me your love, don't run away. Oh, no, 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 baby. I got things to show you tonight. Lydian and Moses Radio, you know, being together wasn't a big surprise for me. I mean, I used to see them together. They know the words that they first said to each other when they first met back at campus. I know my life. 
my family knows like everybody around me knew what was going on so them speculating and writing all this nonsense in the papers was i was like it doesn't matter it will blow over it happens in showbiz all over the world uh, people date their managers people date within the business so it's just like two lawyers get married two doctors have a child together no one looks at that but when two artists have a child together then that becomes you know subject for conversation i think she's right she's free to marry or date or get children with whoever she wants i mean as long as they're both adults consenting that's their business everyone has their own view about that relationship but um, she was happy, and that's all that mattered. I mean, it sounds cliche, really, <laughs> saying it, my friend is happy, so I'm happy. But that's the truth. I mean, when two people love each other, I mean, what can you do about it? In a bid to silence their critics, Lillian's doubters, and what Moses and Lillian had between them, they welcomed another bundle of joy in July 2014, Izuba. And I remember that time, Moses even didn't sleep because it's daughter, so he was... You know, that his little girl is coming into the world. He was very anxious. And I love my children with everything that's in, within me. I don't regret that decision ever in my life. Those blessings that came with my children have brought me this far and made me the woman that I am right now. She's a good mother, a happy one at that. And her children love her and her baby daddy is involved. So yeah, one big nice story. Things were... Of course, not always rosy with, with Moses. We had our ups and downs, break up, make up, break up, make up, and stuff like that. And even if the father is not, I'm not dating him, I'm st I still have this special, these special children that we, we made together. And it's a, you know, a remembrance of. went on to release hit song after hit song, some of which included Kawa, Danger, Kangutwali, among many others. With the high demands from our fans and the steep competition in the industry, plus balancing motherhood, life put her between a rock and a hard place, reminding her of her childhood struggles with her family. It was nerve-wracking and exciting at the same time. That's why I guess I'm not so used to being alone on a stage. Lillian pushed back and stood her ground. The result was the creation of a band that seemed to answer her problems. So I decided to create a band immediately. <laughs> The band for me is my way of, you know, just relaxing and enjoying music because there's no pressure, you know. And I, after having a baby, I really realized that I'm not going to be one of those artists who's going to be shaking their bum on stage, <laughs> who's going to be doing like all those kind of crazy dances. I, 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 I realized that I have to, you know, look a certain way and feel a certain way when I'm doing this kind of music. So when I did the band, I formed a band, The Sundowners, it actually got better because guys preferred the band. Like, Because I don't like to do playback singing anymore. The trend she has taken of doing more live, you know, the live band thing, there is nothing that trains an artist more than the live band. And if we are looking at these times, the relevance of live bands is just growing, so it is a very strategic move that she has taken. She's not so much the recording artist kind of person. She, I think she has to go more on the performing circuit. Like the Sundowners are booked every week, you know. We became a new kind of brand as well. Lillian and the Sundowners, that's a different brand altogether. So also that brought for me a lot of, you know, new clients. You find my, um, me and my band performing at different, you know, corporate functions. And it wasn't as bad as I hoped. 
She was approached by the guys at Big Mike's and uh, to do a gig there. This love for music, this love that I have for music, it kept me going, it kept me pushing, and um, it, 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 it's, it's paid off, it's paid off for me. Sundowners band getting more popularity. It wasn't long before Lillian joined forces with the Deuces Entertainment Group. The result was organizing a concert to officially announce to the public that Lillian indeed has a place in the music industry. I'm so happy to have joined that team because you know they're guys who have a vision for my career. They have they have plans and I already see most of the plans unfolding and now we're having a concert. She had enough songs to make an album, so it was time for her to launch an album, and it was long overdue. There's all this talk of Ugandan artists just uh, lip syncing and miming over songs, but she showed that she actually had the vocal prowess, and I think getting out of Blue 3 helped her kind of spotlight her vocal prowess, because when you see her perform with the Sundowners, you realize that she's actually a live performer. She actually does power of the voice. She doesn't need the studio to help her you know, bring her voice out. She proved to the world, you know, not Uganda, not people in Kampala alone, that she is a very amazing live singer. The success of the concert brought with it the need to produce a new album for Lillian, and Deuces Entertainment Group responded. DEG has produced Lillian's album. It's, it's a 14-track album. I'm very glad to be a part of Deuces Entertainment Group, and I think we're going to do very many big things together. They're fairly new, but they've got the direction. <laughs> On the 1st of February, 2018, Lillian was hit with the devastating news of the passing of the father of our children, Moses Sejibogo, also known as Mose Radio. With this, Lillian has resolved to take care of her children as a single mother and hope to make her music career successful regardless of the industry's pressures. She's very, very focused as an artist. She's, she's, really, she's ready to grow. And ever since the time that we signed her up to now, we've witnessed that kind of growth. I'm sure Martin Luther is proud to see Obama in the house calling shots right now. New day. The genius in this sexy goddess of soul isn't about to stop. She's steadily picking up the momentum she deserves to get this songstress back on track with her band members, the Sundowners. She has proven time and time again that her voice is what has elevated her to the heights only divas can understand. And now that the storm is over, Lillian is ready to get you hypnotized with her charms as she entertains you with the sunset. Your love, your love, your love. You're my sunshine, my one true lover.